So here's a few news articles to look at. <coughs> this keeps happening. If you use WordPress, WordPress is written in PHP, and it's a lot more secure than it used to be. But people add these third-party plugins, and the plugins keep on having uh, up file upload vulnerabilities and so on. This new, the latest one is responsive menu. So if you do use WordPress, you should really be careful not to use very many plugins and to watch quite a lot to see if they have vulnerabilities, because a lot of them do. Uh, the, Japan is trying to use a COVID-19 tracing app. As far as I've heard, all over the world, everybody's trying to use these, and they never work. Um, Android and iOS have invented a system where it tries to find out if you've been near another person, but uh, Bluetooth really isn't very good at that, and there are issues of privacy, and so... Uh, Japan went very strong on privacy, so they can't even say how many people have, have installed the app, how many people have reported that they were sick or anything, so they don't even know if it's working. But from just the total number of downloads, they know more than like 20% of people are using it. And these things don't work at all until like 80% of people are using them. And they have to not only use them to see if they've been exposed, but they have to manually report when they have turned positive. And unless people are doing that, it's ineffective, and no country has got it work enough well, working well enough, I think, where that's happening. So this idea of contact tracing through an app seems to be a pig in a poke, as far as I can tell. And so you probably heard about this. There was a uh, power plant where somebody connected to a control console and tried to turn up the amount of lye in the water to a level that would poison people. And uh, somebody prevented that right there. But now they find out that everybody just used the same team viewer password. Uh, you've probably heard about the Solar Winds hack that hacked like hundreds of American companies and military and government contractors. And it turns out that Solar Winds was just using a password of Solar Winds 123 for everything. So these guys were using an insecure password, no two factor authentication, just a simple free commercial tool team viewer for remote authentication. And that's what a lot of people do. So. You know, a lot of uh, hacks come from people just not practicing any real basic security at all. And uh, so this is why if you want to keep people secure, you have to design apps that are secure by default. You can't assume that users are going to be careful and follow best practices. You better make it so that even if they put in the minimum possible, it's good enough. Anyway, I thought students might benefit from this. Um, just a list of recommendations of how people ruin their security careers through bad habits. Um, like the point of the company is typically not security. Secure, the point of the company is something else like selling food or making cars or something. And the security people just focus on security. But, you know, security is just a small part of the company. And they get focused on some small problem. They talk down to other people like non-technical managers and uh, limit their career by being too arrogant. So these are pretty good career advice. There's a bunch of these, and they're pretty good. So you might want to look through that list. And this, I thought, is very important, especially for this class, where um, people are finding vulnerabilities in web apps and sometimes trying to earn bug bounties and such. Um, when you find vulnerabilities, people sometimes go nuts on you. This footfall cam is a wildly insecure hardware product uh, the security researcher bought it, and he found that what's inside there is just a Raspberry Pi module. And when you look at what's on the Raspberry Pi module, it's just some developer's operating system with MP3 files and configuration files containing VPN credentials and all sorts of stuff that should not be there. So it's incredibly amateurish, poorly built product, just making amazing foolish mistakes. And it has a lot of other vulnerabilities. So he reported all that, and the company contacted him and said, uh, we would like to hire you to help us fix these problems. And so he quoted them some hourly rate, and then they accused him of extortion, made a bunch of extra accounts to accuse him of being racist, reported him to the police, reported him to all kinds of social networks, and just tried to ruin his life. And this tends to happen. People freak out when you tell them about security problems, so it is a thing to be aware of. Um, you, if you don't want to risk all this abuse, you should only research products that, where the company has a bug bounty platform. Now, if they have a bug bounty program, then 
there is some understood way to report a vulnerability and then they'll probably just tell you it's not the right phone we don't care we won't pay you any money but they usually won't subject you to all this abuse um, but companies that don't have a bug bounty program uh, it's best to just leave them alone sometimes I do it but I'm willing to accept the possibility of them coming back after me like this and they do but um, you know you, it's a risky thing to do and I certainly don't recommend it for beginners because uh, you know you might get accused of something awful and end up in a lot of trouble anyway so here we are at 129s I'm just checking for questions and there aren't any so I'll just get to the official stuff here which we have quite a bit of so we're here at mapping the application which is uh, exploring all the pages in a web application and let me get my uh, slides up had them up but then I had to transport them into PDF to publish them so now I'll bring them up again all right good well, yeah, I could probably do that. It might be a little better. Um, nope, it's not going to be better. I won't be able to see it. All right, got to do this. All right. So, all right. So, you're trying to enumerate all the pages in an application, all the, its functionality. And the idea is to, the, this is what you call finding the attack surface. Um, how many ways can I feed data into this thing? Uh, what vulnerabilities does it appear to have? That's what you're trying to do. So uh, web spiders are the simplest way you do this. You run an automated program. And what a web spider does is it loads a page and then it ev clicks every link and loads that page, and clicks every link and loads that page, and so on, until it's gone to some limited depth. Because, of course, if you let that go on too long, it'll eventually uh, just reach the whole Internet or some ridiculous number of pages. So you, um, that's a web spider. And the web spider then faces some things that are not as simple as a page that just has links on it and images. It has HTML forms that have submit buttons and stuff. So the spider might try to fill in all the forms with random values or something and hit the button to try to get to the next page. It might look inside things like JavaScript to find URLs. Uh, ZAttack Proxy does this pretty well. Um, and so there are other things that affect this. For example, one thing that is an old recommendation to put on websites is this robots.txt file that specifies what automated spiders should find. So it'll tell you, um, don't go into certain domains. I don't want these domains indexed by the Google bot and so on. But it doesn't prevent them from going in there. It's really just sort of a, a, rec a request. And so your more reputable sites like Google will probably honor this request. But there's nothing to stop hackers from going into there. In fact, they're more likely to look in there saying, well, they don't want people going in there. That might be where the goodies are. So the other thing about automatic spidering is, of course, it can't handle complicated user interface elements like dynamically created JavaScript menus, links buried in Java applets, and so on. It won't really find everything a human would find. And forms might have validation checks where you can't just fill them with random data. It checks to make sure the phone number is right and the zip code is right and stuff like that. So when your automated process tries to fill in the form, it will just bounce to some error page instead of getting through to the rest of the app. Another thing is the spider keeps track of the URLs it's fetched, and it only fetches each URL once, which would be nice if you had an old web point 1.0 page where every page is just a static HTML file. But the problem is now pages are dynamic, and they might have parameters on the form. So one page might lead to many different real pages where they, the difference is in the parameters, and so your web app will not realize that. And uh, so, for example, you might everything might be an account.jsp, and then there might be a parameter like account uh, list my accounts, account transactions, account change address, that sort of thing. And the spider will think there's just one page and not index those other pages. Uh, so also, uh, the opposite happens. Sometimes applications put some data in the URL that randomly changes, and then the spider will keep fetching that page over and over and over thinking it's a different page oh, and I see a question about captchas yes of course and the whole point of captchas these scrambled things you have to type in is to stop robots from getting any further so if you have a captcha then an automatic spider will not get past that page and that's that's the whole point of it so 
you know, be aware of these limitations of automatic spidering. Now, so you can, if you spider a page without giving it any login credentials that work, then you'll just see the unauthenticated part of a page, which is often not the most interesting part, but it might be what you want. Now, you can give your spider credentials to log in as, and that might be fine, but then it might often log itself out as it spiders the page by clicking the logout function or doing something that triggers some kind of detection on the uh, server that says, wait a minute, this person is not acting like a normal customer, so we're going to kick them out. In fact, if you obey the recommendations in this course, in this book, they would tell you to do that. When you see a pattern of activity from somebody that makes it clear they're not really a customer, you ought to just be kicking them out. Very few sites really do that, but it's a good practice. Here's another fun one. If you give them your credentials that have privileges, like administrative credentials, then they're going to find the administrative page and start clicking all the buttons, like delete user, shut down database, read our server. You know, you can trash the entire website this way. So it is a problem that these automatic spiders, you have to be aware. A more sophisticated way is user-directed spidering, which we're going to do later with Burp, where you, you human search through the site, and Burp is just used to keep track of all the pages you've seen and all the requests so you can examine them in more detail. All right, and I guess I'll do that right now. Let me start my Burp. So here, Burp is loading up, and I just hit Next, or delete the old stuff, Next, start Burp. All right, so here's my burp, and I go to the proxy tab, and I turn off intercept. I had students getting in trouble with this in my other class. Uh, you always have to do this. The first, as soon as you start burp, you have to turn off intercept, or burp will block all the traffic and not do anything, and that's no fun. And then I'm going to open browser in here. Now I got the burp browser, and I'm going to go to my page, Hackazon. That's Sam's class. Uh, info, which is a fake shopping site designed for security research or security training, so you can practice doing things on this page. So here I am on this page, and I'm not signed in because there's a sign in button up there. And let me see if I can make it bigger. I can. Good. All right. There's a sign in button there. So I'm currently not authenticated. So let's take Burp and go to the target page, and you'll see what Burp makes of this. It is keeping track of what I've done. So it goes to Hackazon. It has found all these parts of the page just from what I've done so far. So for example, there's a cart. There's nothing in there but view. And there's a user container. And there's a login, password, and register in there right now, but nothing else. So let me uh, shrink this a little bit and uh, move it over here. There. Make sure they both fit on the screen. Looks like they do. All right. So. Now, uh, let me uh, put shop, let's buy this, whatever it is, add to cart, and you see now I have an add button in the cart, and now there's a product, and if I buy something else, like this, add to cart, there it goes. So this is me going through the website, and here's Bert keeping track of everything I do. So if I want to, I can go back and examine every request and response and cookie and figure out what it did. So now signing in is often real important. So I'm going to sign in. I made an account earlier. So, all right, now when I sign in, see now um, the user container contains more, now it contains a logout button that it didn't used to have. And so on. That's the thing. As you surf the site, it keeps track of everything here. And you can save all of this and then wander through this and understand how it works. So now let's do one simple thing I like to do, which is understand how it knows who I am. So if I go to um, proxy history, I'm just going to delete all this old stuff because I don't care about it right now and I want to make my life simpler. Now I'm going to go to a your account page and uh, say my profile. OK, I got a page at my name. And um, hmm, I was hoping it would make a request for that. What if I refresh that page? There we go. See, what I've done here is I've made a page that sent a request, and the response shows that it knows who I am. Somewhere in this response, let's see if I can make it look good and put this on the screen. Okay, somewhere in this response should be my name. 
and I am not seeing it there. Hmm, my account. That's kind of funny. That has username. Um, search. Let's search for AOL. There we are. Okay. So I am in here. And uh, there we are. It's down here someplace. Okay. That's all I wanted to see. So now I can find out how this works. And here it's incredibly obvious. There's only one cookie that could possibly be being used to identify me here. That one. But if you wanted to check it, and we'll try this later with uh, another website with a little more depth to it, then, um, so here's my request. And when I send that request again, it still finds me, AOL dot. Yep, it's still finding me, Sam at AOL.com. So I'm still logged in. But if I change this cookie, like if I change that zero to a one, and now I send a request, now I get a different error. I get a 302 found, but then it doesn't give me my name. So now I'm not logged in. So now I know this is the thing that keeps track of who I am. And, you know, in a more complicated site, it would be harder to find. And this process is a good way to track it down. Anyway, I think we're about up to some cahoots. Yeah, that's what I showed you. All right. Let's get the cahoots here, which should be up there. And there they are. All right. I want uh, favorites, 129S, for A. There we go. All right. Now I go here. Yeah, years ago, I used to use these things called eye clickers that do this in the little radio signals when all the students are in the same room. But nowadays, most of my students are remote, even before the pandemic, most of them were. So this online system is better. All right, we got 17 in the room, I guess. So I'll wait a few more seconds. If there's 17 people, I would expect at least 10 to come into the uh, Kahoot. Maybe not. Okay, I'll wait a little bit. All right, I guess that's it. Okay, what tool will find every page on a web app? Spider, good. All right, what part has validation rules? Okay, the forms do, and I see the lag is pretty big today, but I guess it's all right. All right, what feature is not a problem for a spider?
like many pages, and this is of course the point of a spider, and the point of automated vulnerability scanning is that they will really do all the boring things. They will click every link and go to every page, and the human will probably not do that as much as focus on the areas of interest and try to analyze them deeply. So an automated scan is part of a good pen test, but you have to also have the human directed part of it. All right. So what risk is there if you have Spider while authenticated as administrator? Yes, it could do an activity like delete the site. All right. How do you use BERT to examine HTTPS? You add the certificate to the browser, or really to the operating system under the browser, or of course now we're using the built-in browser that has that already added in. All right, what BERT feature stops all traffic? Okay, that's the intercept. All right, good. So, they'll have to tell me who that is if they want their points. And the same there. Yep, they're all using fake names. You're not gonna get their points unless they tell me who they are at some point. All right. So, Go back to the slides. There we go. All right, so if you do what I did and a user is just going through, then they can follow through all the steps and then enter valid data and so on, and you follow it with burp. So that's manual spidering. Now, by the way, you can use Chrome all by itself or Firefox without burp, and you can use developer tools to just see what's going on. You can open developer tools and it will show you all the parts of the page loading and even how long it takes to load. And it, uh, this is often handy when you're designing a page and trying to find out why it's loading slowly and such. It's an option. And you can get various printouts here, uh, even like a waterfall diagram to show how long it took to load different parts of the page and such. So it can be useful. All right. And then, of course, there's hidden content. Uh, this is a big issue because of one of the common vulnerabilities called insecure direct object references. One thing that happens on a lot of websites is they put something you're not supposed to see, like the administration control panel, in a directory and they just don't put a link to it. And they think you won't find it, but of course they don't actually protect it with permissions. So it doesn't like check your cookie to make sure that you're authorized before you see it. They just think you won't find it if they make the URL a little hard to find. This is the same as hiding a key under the mat. There's nothing to stop the wrong person from taking it. You just hope they won't find it. And so uh, one thing you have to do is look for hidden content, content that is not linked from the links you can find on the page. Ah, good. I see a name here. Okay. Good. Uh, let me just make a note. Hi, Internet. I know who that is. Good. Good. Anyway, so, all right. So you might find debugging features, uh, 
other kinds of different categories of people here, or might see different kinds of content, you might be able to find backup files or backup archives, which would be very handy. They might contain source code. You know, lots of good things might be there. Um, old versions of the website, things that are in testing but not yet integrated, um, that sort of thing. Um, or even default functionality from an off-the-shelf application included. This happened to a lot of Internet uh, Microsoft Windows users. Old versions of IIS shipped with a bunch of uh, demonstration functions that were poorly written and vulnerable. So when you installed IIS and put in your website, you could go use those functions to see things you weren't supposed to see. So um, you can find configuration files. It might, might contain database credentials, source files, comments, and log files. Log files can really be dangerous. There was a vulnerability that came out that I think um, one of the big Android vulnerabilities went through log files. You can sometimes take the logging feature and redirect it to write to a different file and do something like change a user password or execute a command with elevated privileges. Um, or you can just look in the log files and find other people's session tokens and so on. <coughs> So brute force techniques are where you just try to guess a word. So if I see some words like this, I see a login, forgot password, and so on, then I can just try all these other words here. There's a few names here like auth, home, pub, images. So if I just have a list of all the common words you find on websites, I could just try them all. And Burp has a brute forcer to do this. But they punish you with the free version by making the brute forcer run very slowly. So you could get your 30 or 90 day trial of the pro version and try that. Or if you want to do this, you can use the tool Derby that's included in Kali Linux and it will automatically try a whole bunch of words. So I ran it on my Hackazon website and you can see it's already finding a lot of things. Um, it's doing them alphabetically. So this is just the A, B and C and it's finding all these things on the page. And then it records you the uh, HTTP code it got. So this code 200, it actually loaded the page the 302 is a redirect. The 500 is some kind of error on the server. So anyway, those are pages that gave some kind of interesting response that might lead somewhere. That's what I usually use as derb. All right. Let's try another one of these. 4B. I think we had about nine last time. I'll wait a few more seconds. Mm hmm. Might be one more. There was high internet last time. Might want to join. Yep, yep, okay. Hey okay, now. All right, looks like that's it. tool shows the timing of the components. Okay, it's Chrome developer tools, that's right. What tool is ineffective in the free version?
All right, the Burt Brute Forcer. All right. And which one shows HTTPS requests just as easily as HTTP ones? But Chrome Developer Tools make it as easy. Now, I understand uh, Burp is easy if you use the built-in browser, but not if you use another browser. So uh, this question is perhaps not as good anymore as it used to be. Anyway, Chrome Developer Tools certainly shows them both the same. And how do you find all the hidden content on a website? Yep, there's no way. Uh, now, of course, the only way would be to get a command line root on the server and actually hunt through every file on the server or something. But even that wouldn't work on a modern application that's spread across many servers. That's the thing. So just like in computer forensics, you can't really get all the evidence. So you just try to get a reasonable amount of it and achieve the goal. And you accept that there's probably some stuff you did not find. Okay, I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> Kunal, that looks like a real name. And clickers. I've seen a name I've seen before. If they come out of the closet, they can collect some points. But they can choose to remain anonymous and forego the points. Anyway, all right. So um, you can look for patterns like here. So if they have something called forgot password, you can try things like add password, get password, reset password. I've had pretty good luck with this sometimes. Like I went someplace. Um, yeah, it is showing the question super late. The delay is pretty big today, like 10 seconds late. Yeah. Anyway, um, hopefully it works because I added 10 seconds to the time for each question. So it, um, it should be okay, just a little screwy. And uh, anyway, so look for other patterns. Like I remember I went to someone's website. They wanted me to check it, and the login was login2. So I just went to login1, and there was all this insecure stuff. Anyway, you can uh, look for files, find the names, look for patterns. And uh, any of these components in the page may have file names and folder names, and they may suggest other files and folder names. Uh, you can look for temporary files. Uh, if you a Mac has been used to create the files, it creates this .ds store file. If you edit a file and save it, it often on a Unix system, it often adds a dash one to the end or something like that because it doesn't want to overwrite an old file. Uh, Microsoft Office files create temporary files while they're being edited that are often left behind. So you know these are other files that might be sitting around, extra copies of files. Uh, Burp has a content discovery that will try all of these, uh, which is nice. I don't know how well it works in the free version, but it is pretty, uh, it'll try a lot of uh, common items. Google wrote a thing called Skipfish. I'm not sure if they've been updating it, but it was pretty good at finding every page on a site, of course, because that's Google's main thing, uh, a, a crawler. Anyway, you can also go to search engines, especially if you learn how to use advanced search in Google and such, which is very useful. To find things, you can use the cached content in Google, and you can also use the Wayback Machine. By the way, the Wayback Machine is also a good way to get past paywalls. You can take a snapshot of a page and then view the snapshot, and you can look for forums that talk about pages. Uh, here's some Google advanced search tricks. You use site colon to restrict it to a certain site. Um, then you put a word here like login, so this will get you all the pages that refer to login on that site. Um, 
you can find sites that link to other sites, sites that are related to other sites, and there's a lot of other advanced um, advanced options here. Ooh, all right, I got to turn on mute there. All right, we don't really affect one student, but anyway, I had both of the sounds on, which would be bad for people that were in Zoom. Anyway, um, some web servers let you list directory content. One of mine does. If you just go to a folder and there is not an index.html, it will show you all the files in the folder. So that's a good thing. Um, and also, you can often trick websites into showing the source code of scripts. This happened to uh, IIS again. There was a time when ASP files, you could just put colon data or colon dollars data at the end of the, the URL, and it would show you the raw script instead of the result of running the script. And a lot of programmers don't know this, and they put secrets in scripts like passwords and API keys. And it's a dangerous activity. A lot of people are waking up to it now, though, because of GitHub. A lot of people are publishing their code on GitHub. And so it's beginning to humiliate people that put secrets in code, You're beginning to realize you shouldn't be putting secrets, hard coding them in your code, <laughs> because people might see that code. Nikto is something that scans a web service for just a short list of known problems. And Wikto is a Windows version. It's fast and easy to use, um, but I never find too much with it. But anyway, it certainly is. Uh, sometimes you'll find good things here. It always complains about this stuff. You made a cookie without the HTTP only flag and so on. But occasionally it will point out that you have a well-known vulnerability on your website. All right, another thing is, we mentioned before, you might just have everything done by one page, bank.jsp. So it's always the same, you are, it's always the same, uh, file name, but all the information comes in in parameters. So you use the same page for transferring and other things from account to account and so on. Uh, this Then you'd have to explore the function not by the uh, folders and files, but by all the values of this parameter. So you'd make a chart like this, login, bill payment, enter amount, confirm payment, and so on. You'd have to sort of make a tree of all the things that this site can do. All right, uh, you may look for requests, add debugged requests or tests, this sort of thing. Burp can do it in the intruder tag we'll be using later. And so you try to figure out how the application works. Figure out how it does the main thing the site is for. Check for areas that often have trouble connecting to other sites, like logging, uh, error messages, redirects, how it keeps track of who you are, as you move from page to page, how it handles login and logout, password change, account recovery. These are often areas where there are serious security problems. Uh, look where it handles user process, any kind of user supplied input. Our, you want to list, list all these and then see if they're vulnerable to code injection. Um, you may have things like uh, Java applets, not Flash anymore, but ActiveX. You want to know what server-side technologies are out there. What kind of web server software are they using? What kind of email does it connect to? What kind of database does it connect to? And so on. And here's places where users can put in input. Everything in the URL, of course, all the parameters, everything in a post request, and cookies, and quite a few areas of the header, like referrer and user agent, you can often inject in there, or host headers even. So, and then there's RESTful type URL. It might look like this, but some of these are really parameters, not folders names. This is not a folder named electronics or a folder named iPhone 3G. It's really parameters. So the same kind of thing. Um, this is updates, but those are probably parameters, not really folder names. And so this is the normal layout of a page. You have a URL, and then you have a query string, like q equals duck, to look for a duck on Google. But you can do it a lot of other ways. You know, you program a web server to take it in any format. You can use a semicolon. You can use a dollar sign for a separator. You can URL encode it all. There's just a lot of ways to do it. You can put slashes over here and equals over there. You know, it's sort of cruel, it would be a whole lot nicer for everybody if there was just one standard way to do it. 
and we could all count on that, but that's not what's happened. It's sort of sprawled out to all these bizarre different ways to lay out the objects. So user agent is used to determine whether you're using a phone or a browser or whatever you're using and then adjust the screen, um, but you might be able to inject other data into there and you might be able to reach a different page by changing the user agent and there might be a vulnerability on the mobile page that's not on the desktop page and so on. Another thing, of course, I mentioned before, if you change the user agent to like the Google search bot, you'll see a different page often than the one they show normal users because a lot of people like to get free advertising that way by showing stuff on Google that looks good and then when people try to go there and they're not Google then you try to charge them money to get to that page. Uh, if you're behind a load balancer or a proxy you might see X forwarded 4 which gives you information about which of the servers behind that device you're seeing and um, you have out of band channels. You might be able to send in data by email. You might be able to just send traffic which will get caught by the intrusion detection system and then get stuck in a log somewhere that might be visible in the web application. Uh, you might be able to find data from some other server that moves over or uh, find some kind of API interface for other things. Uh, there was a um, I remember when Twitter was new, there were people who were tweeting over email. And I think you can still do that. You can configure your Twitter account to send emails from something and they appear as tweets, that sort of thing. Anyway, let's try some cahoots about that. 4C, all right. So how do you people know there's a lag? What do you see that one thing the student told me is it uh, it tells you whether you're right or wrong when the questions are still up there or something? So when you edit this file, what file is created? Really? Answers are on Kahoot. Oh while questions are still going on. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I see. So you, oh, okay, so the lag is kind of a problem, but you can't really win that way, I suppose, can you? I don't think you could be the top because it would take you more time to answer. Well, that's interesting. Okay, thank you for telling me. I wonder if there's any way I can, I'm going to stop the streaming briefly and then restart it to see if the lag goes down. Could that actually face the channel? You no, know, you're lying. Okay. Start streaming. All 
that's not the problem. Okay, looks like the streaming is back up. All right, and I think the lag might be a little better. One, two, three. Yeah, the lag is back to three seconds now. Anyway, should be more normal. Somehow the lag was up to 10 seconds. Anyway. Oh, should have turned off the recording too while that was happening, but such is life. So, let's try the next one. All right. All right. Which system might put data stiff from network packets sniffed into a web app? That's the intrusion detection system might do that. All right, and what header might expose private data from one website to another website? That's the refer. Another reason you should not put sensitive data in the URL, because that URL goes a lot of foolish places, like the referrer of the next page. What phone scan runs on Windows? All right, and that's Wicto. All right, no, you should be seeing the stream, Pangui. Other people are seeing it. Hi, Internet. And hey now, okay. And Kunal, good, all uh, two-time winners. Yeah, other people are seeing it, yep. Maybe you need to restart your browser or something. Anyway, so we're back to the last section, and uh, maybe we should take a break because that's going to be long and it's been about an hour. Well, let's take a break until three. Give us about seven minutes. I'll break this recording.